Right brain realism is the antithesis of the idea that any of us are only creative or analytical, and instead posits not that you can be both or should be both, but that you already are. We're going to look at not only the antiquated idea of right brain versus left brain, but challenge all the things we think we know about ourselves and how we think, learn, and communicate for a greater sense of balance in our lives, which will hopefully allow for a greater sense of self-awareness, purpose, and empathy, and offer practical methods to help us get a little closer to the people we want to become. Let's get to it. Good day to you folks and welcome to another episode of Right Brain Realism. I'm your host, Austin Morris, and I'm, as always, excited about today's guest. Um, I met today's guest uh, last October um, at uh, our agency's expo. I was kind of the new kid on the block uh, with our agency and um, Michael was lovely enough to, to show me around and introduce me to the old cats and uh, the old the old artists that we work with and yeah you did you did it was great I'm nice yeah he was a nice guy at least that day um but yeah so welcome to the show folks uh writer comedian director ventriloquist producer and exotic bird trainer michael paul <laughs> ballet parking attendant amateur gynecologist yeah yeah absolutely he's he wears a lot of hats folks he yeah. wears a lot of hats how are you michael you doing well I I am very well. Good morning. It's morning when we're recording this. So good morning to you. Yeah, yeah. That's perfect. Uh, yeah, it's 10.15-ish uh, for, for you over there in LA. And, uh, it is. And I, I here in the middle of the nowhere. That's yeah. uh, right after lunch. That's perfect. Well, you know, I, I um, for years, I was a night owl. I mean, throughout high school and then my job, obviously, you're working clubs at night and everything. Yeah. And I, even if I wanted to go to sleep early, I couldn't. And, you know, I would sleep late. Because, well, it wasn't, my mom said I slept late. I'm like, mom, I got done work at two in the morning. It's not late. But now yeah. with COVID, like after the first month or two of just, you know, goofing off and doing whatever, I'm in this like weird old man phase where no matter what time I go to bed, I always wake up at 730. It is so irritating. You know, you can, you can frame that the other way. It's, it's both an old man phase and like a toddler phase. So you can just say yes. you're younger than ever. Well, yeah. physically old man, emotionally tough. That's right. Yeah, it's a nice mix. Meet in the middle. I'm fine perfect. with that. Yeah. Oh, man. But uh, so for those of you who don't know Michael, I, I think actually a lot of you will. A lot of you will at least recognize his face. Um, you might not recognize his left hand because uh, it is often up the butt of a puppet. Uh, <laughs> um, he uh, kind of rose to a household name-ish last year on America's Got Talent, um, had one of the best like cold opens any of those shows have ever had, uh, which you actually wrote and kind of directed yourself, if I'm not mistaken, yeah? I did. Um, yeah, you know, you gave that long laundry list of uh, what I do, and that's kind of why I'm not a household name, not that I ever necessarily aspired to that, but uh, I always say that I've skyrocketed to the middle and because, you know, for years I, and we can get into the whole psyche of it all if you want, but, you know, for years, there were many, many things that I liked and wanted to try. And I thought that was great and exciting. And really, whether it's a regular job or a show business job, people are like, okay, but what do you do? You know, I didn't stick with one thing for 30 years and then become uber successful in any one thing. So for years, when I realized that I had made that error and my life was halfway over uh you know for a while it pained me and then i it actually really um worked for my production work for writing yeah. and directing and storytelling and technology and all of that because i have uh i'm lucky to have a, a box full of tools to help unlock people from different backgrounds so um yeah so literally uh, you know it was like on a monday I'm doing stand up on a Tuesday. I was puppeteering for you know Jim Henson on a Wednesday. I was writing jokes for late night talk show, and it's just kind of how it worked out to piecemeal yeah. paying my rent. Uh, but I also know that years later, after going to therapy, I also know <laughs> that it is uh, it was about validation, and I was like 
living for 20 years in a panic just to like survive. So, yeah, just to get to the uh, next much thing. Common. It's really funny. You said uh, you just do all these things and I've also done a lot, but yeah, it's, it's like that question when someone asks how you are, you're just supposed to say fine. You're not actually supposed to. Oh yeah. They don't want to know how when I someone am. asks When someone asks like at a cocktail party, so what do you do? Like that is supposed to be oh. three words or less. I'm an accountant. Like, but when yeah. you do 90 things, it's and like, then ah, goes, I'm oh. a performer. Yeah. I, well, you know, I don't even, well, first of all, in California, you know, normally in other areas of the country or the world, when people say, what do you do? It's because, you know, in our society, work takes up a lot of time and it's something to talk about. But in California, in, in LA, when it, where it's just a horrible industry town, yeah. what do you do really means, do I want to continue talking to you <laughs> or not? <laughs> That's what, what do you it do means. means, are you worth wasting the next four right, minutes exactly. on this conversation? Will you or should I go me? find someone more famous that right. will do will something you, for Will me? you give me a job or will you give me a lifestyle that I am accustomed to? So, for, for, so I, and it was so weird. So like after month three, I realized how I had to like deal with people here at a party. I never tell people what I do and I do not ask what they do and it drives them crazy. Oh and so I'll talk so about fun. anything else. I'll talk about your beard, your glasses, your girlfriend, that map behind you. But um, I won't talk about that. And then when I leave and they ask someone else about me, then they're interested in either dating me or hiring me or something like that. So, but in general, you know, I don't tell people what I do. I'll just say, oh, you know, like everyone else, I'm in production. That's a, that's a smart, that's a smart way to handle it. I'd say in any town, but it sounds like an intensely smart way to handle it. I don't know, it. but when people in are like, town. yeah, but I mean, when people are like, I'm an actor, I'm like, all right, that's not impressive. That's like one step up from homeless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, Everyone's done an extra gig. You, you even say it in, I think the intro of your, of your book, which we'll talk about, um, but everybody in, in New York has done at least one episode of Law and Order. Like, oh, yeah, you know, right. yeah, you can be an actor, uh, which, right. which is not to disparage Law and Order. It's not no, to disparage I, working extras. It is not I, to disparage those things. It is just- I would ra- Yes, I would rather someone say to me, I'm, try- I'm, I'm working on being an actor. I'm trying to be a writer, but I'm a waiter right now. I would have more respect for that than someone handing me a business card well, we're doing big things. It's not we, it's you in your studio apartment with your George Foreman grill and your business card. Yeah. And you know what? That is amazing. And more people should live like that. Like more people should live like that. Live cheap and and grind and learn and read a book and uh, more people should. Uh, but you just be books? honest about Are it. Are you a reader? I am. I am a bit of a reader. I've, I've literally here at my desk, I've got my cute little Kindle Paperwhite. Um, I, I actually didn't get a Kindle for a long time because I, I love the- Turning the page, right? Turning the pages. Yeah. But uh, traveling as much as I've been able to for the last few years, it's uh, you can't really take that many books. I was that kid that thought that I was being rebellious by reading with a flashlight under the covers after bedtime. I was, I was that kid. But doesn't it stress you on the iPad, on, on the Kindle, that your book can run out of battery? And the murderer <laughs> is, oh, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, to the good part. Um, yeah, no, luckily that hasn't happened. Uh, this is not a commercial for Kindle Paperwhite, although I should I should reach out but. to Amazon to spot, but it does have a very long battery life, so that hasn't yeah. happened to me yet. Um, but yeah, I, I love I loved the idea, and we'll probably, it, that's kind of probably going to be the theme of the episode. It's just all the different things you've had your hand in throughout your career, um, and, and I love it. Uh, the, the phrase gets tossed around kind of as a as a negative thing, but jack of all trades, master of none. But a lot of people don't realize that that's not the end of the phrase. The phrase is jack of all trades, master of none, but better than a master of one. The yeah. idea, yeah, the whole phrase is it's better to be well-rounded. It's better to I, have world experience and life experience. So right. I, I awesome. always, I, you're right. I always say to performers that it's not enough to just know your side of the work. Um, you really need to be well versed in your what your your crew does, the technology, mm-hmm. the marketing, um, the, especially when you're working with people like in a uh, if you're a singer with a band or lights and sound. They usually just leave it up to other people, but they don't know what it entails to really get that done. So they really yeah. don't know how to talk to people the right way and execute their um, production the way they they should. You know, I'm de- right now. I'm dealing with. Uh, I have a production company with some partners and we have a couple of, we're in production for a couple of shows. And, you know, my phone calls are a couple of things. It's dealing with publicists 
for celebrities. Then I'm dealing with the editors. Then I'm dealing with the graphics package guy and all that kind of stuff. And I know what it really entails to get those things done. Um, so it gives them each a one of those different parts of the industry, each one of those jobs, they have their own language, don't they? Like those little yeah. buzzwords that you kind of have to know, and they know if you are in the know, they know if you're worth talking to. So being right. able and to also converse because, with those people is, right, is right. important. And all, right. And people who don't know what it entails, whether it's a singer asking for lights to be programmed or a client that, you know, wants to see an edit that we're doing, they don't know what it takes. Like they'll ask me two days later to see a rough cut of an edit that is a 45 minute show with about 80 elements. I'm like, are you insane? Um, I had There's someone ask me the other there. Yeah, I, we're, we're doing this whole green screen uh, broadcast and we shot it all. And the client who is not a show person, they're, they're kind of an executive. They're like, can we take the uh, reflection from the studio lights out of that guy's glasses? I'm like, not if, um, I mean, if you want to pay for industrial light magic to come in and redo those glasses on every frame, great. But when you take a picture and someone's wearing glasses and there's, there's a flash, I'm going down a rabbit hole. Never mind. I'm just saying you should know all aspects of what you're doing. That's all I'm saying. What a fun, what a fun rabbit hole though. Sorry. Honestly, I think that was the, the, um, the best thing I learned in college. Cause a lot of people say you don't need to go to university to be a performer. And there's pros and there's both sides to that. But I will say the best part about getting a degree in musical theater was, you know, doing the year in the shop and a semester in the costume shop and a semester with the lighting designer. And I stage managed to show, I asked to stage manage a show, no, no, Nanette, uh, my junior year, because uh, I've never that done it. That was a Me and Too show, I believe. What? <laughs> that, no, that no was. Nanette. Yeah. Please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no means no, Nanette. Um, or no means no. Hey, wait, can Harvey? I ask you a musical theater question? Yes. What is a zip? I know what it is, but will you explain to me in more specificity what a zip probe is? A sits probe? Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, it's... Uh, so a sits probe, this is... Yeah, this is, that's a kind of a deep cut for... So for the reason theater. I ask is because, yeah, I was in New York theater for a very long time. Uh-huh. Uh, but I was never mounting the production. I always came in later. Yeah. And so I, I have some, these two friends who are now very, very famous uh, composers and lyricists. And I, they told me the other day about their, they're going into this terminology, Zipro, which, so is it so the Q to Q of a production? No, that's, that's, with the orchestra? that's just tech week. So a Zip probe is usually, and my music theater professors are probably gonna message me after this and be like, that's not right. But anyway, no, it's usually the very first time that the singers and actors are with the orchestra. And so often that is done seated on stage or just standing on stage just to kind of get the music all together. Cause the orchestra is not part of the rehearsals for the first part, you know, right, you're usually playing player. just with a pianist, exactly. Um, and going through all your cues and stuff. So often the first, day of tech week or the first part of tech is often the sits uh, where you where you just do, do a run through of the show with the orchestra and the performers together for the first time. Okay. That's, and when that's you did musical the theater, did you keep the beard? Because usually musical, musical theater is no beard unless you're a father. Or something. Uh, I couldn't I couldn't grow a beard till after I was out of college. So that's I horrible. had I had the douchey chin strap all the way through college. I didn't even like it when I had it, but I just I you There's can't no see my job without it. It's when it I used terrible. to do that. I apologize I to, have, to everyone who had to look at it. When that used to be like the hip in thing, like the goatee or the chin strap, people would come up to me and start speaking Spanish. I don't know why. My I guess because I have like an olive skin or whatever, and I'm like I don't know what you're talking. Must about. be nice. Yeah. No. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I, but I did, I did get to keep the beard for, um, the cruise ships I did, uh, in the production cast. And did fact, you, did you do cruise ship production shows? Yeah. Yeah. Did you I wear did, like glitzy, glittery tuxedos and things like that and sing medleys? I don't, I don't want to talk about it, but yeah. I will say uh, that nah. <laughs> I was in review shows for many years as the guest act, which on ships, yeah. they don't do that, but on land, they'd have these big Las Vegas productions and a uh -huh. comedy guest star. And I know every song in the American songbook, but I only know two lines from each song because they just medley everything. 
That's all you need to know. That's all, That's you all need. I especially, know. Yeah, especially when you're, especially when you're the comedian who comes in just to like do the line. Uh, yeah. In fact, I let, I kept my beard on, on ships and I actually kind of let it grow longer than it should have. Uh, looking back, I was like, I can't believe they let me get away with that. And the reason I had to finally trim it was Sir Tim Rice came on, came on board. We did a couple shows with Sir Tim Rice and uh, the, the COO of, of our, of, the company we're we're cast through came up and was like, which is called uh, Belinda King Creative Productions. Oh, Fantastic, excuse me, company. They're very nice. Uh, um, yeah, she came up and was like, oh, so Tim would like you to have your beard a bit shorter. He doesn't understand why what? you why you all um why why you young ones have have such long beards. And I was like, I love it. And then I went and looked in the mirror. I was like. You know what? He's right. This is a little out of hand. So, right. so uh, shouts out to Sir Tim Rice for uh, giving me facial the, hair tips. The thing about working in those production shows was they never, in the bows, announce uh, the the last names generally of like the dancers. So, yes. but, well, in the production shows, they just say the ladies and the gentlemen. But sometimes they'll do the first names. They'll go down the dance line, right? So mm -hmm. you're working with people for like six months in a show, like at a casino or something like that. And you feel really close to these people. And I'm like, oh, my best friend is Maureen. They're like, Maureen who? I'm like, Maureen the dancer. Maureen from the show. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's it's so like, fun. It's like my friend, the magician. It's, I had a magician named Joe ha Holiday. He was a friend of mine. And Carol, who was a lovely assistant. So I just called her and Carol for her whole life. Like her first name was and. And then that took off. And people called her and Carol for like five years. And she hated my guts. That, yeah, you know what? To be fair, it sounds like you deserve that. That's. I don't mind. <laughs> That's line. great. That's perfect, man. So, so we we've talked a bit about the beginning of of my career. Uh, let's talk about the beginnings of yours. Um, you're a Philly guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I Wonderful. grew up in Philly, and like, and um, I loved it. Uh, Philly was great because there was a lot of theater that my parents took me to. It was very close to New York, and also I started out with an interest in uh, television. And Philly was the fourth largest market. So all the network test shows would come down to Philly first. So when I was interning at these stations, I got to see like all these stars and no names that didn't become anything, you know, in that regard, uh, really test out their stuff there. So Philly was great. Yeah. So you, uh, you just talked about interning at these networks. Um, you were... I don't remember if I read this in your book or your bio, but you were the youngest intern at, at the company at the time? Yeah, or? I was one of the youngest interns ever hired for, for NBC. Maybe the youngest still, I, I think. And So were you like the original Kenneth from 30 Rock, the NBC uh, page? I wasn't yeah. that far along because, because I knew nothing. So basically what happened was I was like around, usually to intern, well, first of all, you're supposed to be in college to be able to intern and be a PA. Um, you're and not you supposed were, to be, in, I was in high school. So yeah. what happened was I hated school and I was kind of growing up outside of Philly, like in the sticks, like cow country. And you know, they're all like farm grown and I'm like a little short Jew. And I, <laughs> it, I was, it was awful. It was awful. And in high school, you get in your junior or senior year, they, you're allowed to do the work study program, which most people did for vocational things like fixing cars or learning cosmetology or whatever. Nursing, their CNA, yeah, yeah. Right. So I went to a taping of the morning talk show at this NBC station, and it was at that time hosted by Jerry Penicoli from Extra. And if you know that guy, he's like the lead reporter anchor dude, or was anyway. And when they were filing, filing us out, the studio audience after the show, I took a left and got in an elevator and gave myself a tour of the station. And someone said, can I help you? And I'm like, oh, no, I'm here waiting for it. And I pulled some name off the credits that I had read. I'm like, oh, okay. And through that, I met, so I met one of the executive producers. And to make a long story short, Amazing. they offered me an internship. And I was a freshman, I think. I was a freshman. So and you're like 15. I was like 15, 16, and wow. the school was like, well, we don't know what to do with him. He's unhappy here. He doesn't do his homework. At least we can. I mean, I never did my homework to the point where the teacher would walk by to collect it. I'd be, and I'd, I'd look up. I'd be like, really, we're going to do this dance? So, uh, so, so they let me do it. Um, I wasn't driving yet. My mom had to drive me or, or I'd take the bus. And uh, yeah, and so that, that's how this started. Now, unfortunately for the producer that I was assigned to who hated me because – 
I knew nothing. I was not in college. So when she goes, tell me to do eight things, I'm like, Duh. like, I didn't know what I was doing. And she even said to me, she goes, there are a million students in college that want your position. You have it. You make my job harder and go sit down. And that was how it started. So yeah. So Welcome I, to I, show I, business, huh? Yeah, right. She scared the <laughs> shit out of me. Um, she was, her name was Janet King Johnson and she was a African-American lady with a flat top and later she went to work for Oprah. But, um, <laughs> uh, but all those test shows came in. And then when that agreement, internship agreement was over, the work study program, uh, I had to get a, a few more in town. Um, and then the last one, when the TV station opportunities were over, um, I didn't want to go back to school full time and I couldn't get a regular job at like a mall because I had no, it, like I would have, I needed a job like to make some money and my, and my resume was all production and I was like underage. I couldn't even get a job at like Cinnabon or, you know, and it, you go to the bookstore and they're like, what's the last book you write? I'm like, jugs. I don't know. So I got a job at a local dinner theater that was very, very big on the East coast. And did not only had like kind of C-rated celebrities come through, but they also did these Las Vegas style productions, which is what mm. introduced me to the whole world of Las Vegas and variety acts and singers and jugglers and ventriloquists and all that stuff. And that's how all that began. But I was a technician there first. That's very interesting. So did you, had you performed? Cause obviously you spent most of your career as a performer, but it sounds like you almost started from the tech side. Is that, is that I, everything correct? I did was like starting on one side and then going to the other. Cause I, I liked it all and I was interested. So for that, like when I was younger, yeah. And like I did all the school plays and you know, I was like in fourth grade and I was the, uh, the student, usually the spring concerts hosted by the principal. And I was like the co-host student co-host and the, I had a little boot in the air. I had a little tiny suit and everything. And uh, so, yeah, I was performing and I was doing, puppet shows since I was like in kindergarten and by first, second grade I had a little stage and I would do Boy Scouts and birthday parties for like 20 bucks and things like that so I was always Amazing. kind of performing um, but you know it's just like it's everyone's every performer's story when they're a kid you know you make the family listen to your shows and yeah yeah of course and stuff, you know? yeah grandma and grandpa and pull a coin out from behind her ear yeah 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 um well that's great so so you started kind of on the tech thing. You kind of uh, snuck your way into a couple jobs and, um, and that led you to a pretty successful and varied career. You use, you've used the word variety and that uh, really describes a lot of what you've done. Uh, but through that, you've gotten to work with some, some fantastic names. Um, like you mentioned, Jim Henson, uh, I think Letterman, um, and, and it just took you through kind of a grind because again, America's Got Talent, which, which a lot of people might describe as quote unquote, your big break came last year. So talk about um, just what it was like to, to work in the industry and do all the things. And, and cause like you said, that to any young performer out here or parents of a young performer, that, that dreaded question, what do you do? Or, well, what's your real job? Like, are that's the worst question so um talk a little bit about just what it was like to get up and change every day and how you keep going with a grind like that not knowing what your next paycheck is going to be what your next week is going to be just talk a little bit about how fun or how difficult the um the grind was well you know i i had a, a couple of emotional things that were in my way like uh I, even if I wanted to act or any of those other things, I didn't have a chance to go to college for any of that stuff. I was, my family had some problems and I was on my own really, really young and I needed a job. Um, I was already working. I was doing temp jobs in a restaurant job and working at that dinner theater as a technician. And I, but I, it didn't feel quite right that I wanted to be a technician the rest of my life. And I met all these variety acts and I thought, all right, I'm going to work on my stand up. And I did stand up first, right as the comedy boom was happening in the United States, where every TV show, every restaurant, every that was having comedy Head nights. Comedy. So and this is what the the early mid. It was eighty eight, maybe eighty nine, okay. I guess. And um, and then when I was doing stand up for a couple of years, then I met a ventriloquist who said, "You know, you're already doing the puppets, and there's a million stand up comics. It would make it more marketable instead of just a guy in front of a mic if you integrated the puppets into the act." So. It took me a while to kind of turn that into an act. Little did I know that 30 years later, I've been dragging around a box full of shit the rest of my life and I hate it, but uh, <laughs> it's a pain. But, um, 
but especially when the box starts talking to you that's that's a weird i don't do that so um i'm not crazy i mean i am but not in that yeah so so, um yeah that uh and how to build that career i mean look it was before it sounds so old it was before the it was like the internet was just getting started and but there was no like cds or dvds and you weren't putting videos online yet so i would sit in my house in my apartment and I would have an assembly line of folders and pictures and, you know, fake press releases because I didn't have any, you know, resume yet. Uh, a bad, bad demo that I finally got. Then I sent it to everyone, every agent that I knew. And that kept me from working for like another three, two years because it was so bad. And, um, but... Uh, but you said fake press releases. Did you write your own press releases oh, and then sure. like clip them into it? That's amazing. Yeah. I thought I well they didn't have Photoshop back then. I would make do cut things out and do clip art and pictures and then go to the copying center and copy them. And I would make things up. Yeah, the version of that now is starting your own like anonymous entertainment blog or whatever, or three of them. You can do three of them. You just, right. just buy a yeah. domain name and then yeah, you say, right. write your own thing with the, well, now, it, now it's a shame because people are like, they see a great picture of you with somebody or so mad or something. People are like, oh, did you Photoshop that? I'm like, that is real. I no, I did that. No, that, that one's real. Yeah. I, I faked so, that press release, but that's a real picture. But I didn't really have a, you know, no one in my family was in entertainment. So it's not like they knew how mm. to help me. And I had to, and it was kind of a sink or swim kind of thing. And so, you know, for a long time, it was like, fake it till you make it. But I never really knew when I had made it. So like for 20 years, I was living in an absolute panic, thinking that I was going to be found out that I was like a hat or something like that. And, and we've talked a lot about imposter syndrome on this podcast. Like, it's oh, yeah, so real for anybody, especially performers. I yeah, think it's terrible. And it really, really probably for anybody. Yeah. And that that held me back for many, many years. Uh, also, because a lot of people went to school for musical theater, which was always something I always wanted to do. And I, I relate to very much, but I, I was not given those skills. In fact, about three years ago, and I have this thing, I don't like singing in public, even though I put music in my show. Um, I, like I know how, like I've had training for singing and I know how to do it. Like and in my house, I have good tone and mask and all of that, but I can't do it in front of people. I can't relax enough and let go. God, and about three years ago, a friend of mine was doing a Broadway concert but it wasn't in New York. It was like Arizona or somewhere. And he had a couple of names and his character actor failed. And he was like, would you come in and do it? I'm like, you do not want me to do that. I cannot even, I don't even think my voice could sustain three songs with that kind of projection. He's like, no one else is going to ask you. This is your chance to finally, you know, I like to do things that that I'm afraid of. To scare you a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. So I did it. I would say, Eight out of 10 songs were, were really good. I did quite well. One of them I totally ruined, but it was also Thanks. the orchestra. We didn't have a chance to rehearse with the orchestra and they were kind of a little goofy, you know? Just broke. Yeah, we didn't get that at all. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, and one of them we had to cut. I'm like, there's no way I can accomplish this. But I did it and I put it on the you internet too. I also put on the internet uh, when I had a dancer, Broadway dancer friend of mine teach me combinations for a couple of weeks, just not for a professional reason, just so I could see if I could do it. And yeah. by the fourth one, I thought first time we fourth time we met, I thought I am getting quite good at this. And I recorded it, and I thought no one will ever see this tape. It is the worst white man middle aged terrible video. But just to out myself, I put it on my YouTube channel about uh, oh thank God six months ago. I was gonna say I. Uh... I wish this was like a, a late night talk show because I wish I could say, actually, we've got the video Here right it now. Is. So, so yeah, yeah. So instead, we'll just direct everyone to go to your YouTube page and watch yeah, it. Yeah, it's Michael Paul amazing. Live. It's in there. That's so good. Um, perfect. So we talked about just the, the grind of it and going through and especially, like you said, not not having a family of performers. Um, yeah, none of my family's in this industry. They're all mostly teachers and nurses. And I'm sure and it's painful pilots. for them. They want to help you, but they don't know how. Yeah, it's it, it's great because it, it's kept me grounded because I'm not surrounded by the um, the bright lights of it all and everyone's like, oh, that's going to be great. I'm, I'm surrounded by very grounding people and, that, and that's been great for me to keep to keep working and, you know, always have like a, a side hustler or, or those sorts yeah. of things to kind of keep moving it, through. 
it's important and, and to, 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 to speak to your earlier question, I mean, you know, sometimes, and the AGT thing and all that, you know, I, uh, I did a couple of motion pictures that got me some notoriety. I did the Tonight Show and a few other things, but you know, th those kinds of things for the regular performer, not the 10% household names, you know, those things come only every couple of years and then in between mm -hmm. you're just trying to work. So, and accumulate, you know, a resume. People are like, oh, your resume is really good. I'm like, that took 30 years for those yeah. 10 things or whatever it is, you know. Um, but that's that's kind of uh, an interesting point, though, is, is like you said, that there's a very small percentage of people who want to be performers, who call themselves performers, who actually make any money doing it. And then the people who, who actually are, quote unquote, professional performers, 90% of them, you have no idea what their names are. You have no idea. Yeah. But they're still working performers. You know what I mean? The, these comedians, these ventriloquists, these regional theater production cats. Um, the yeah, orchestra you, guys, it's amazing. Right. I mean, even on a more celebrity level, like, you know that actor James Cromwell? He, he yes. played the farmer yeah. in Pig or in, Babe or whatever babe, it was. Yeah. So a lot of people are like, oh, I know, oh, that guy, but they don't know his name. And I sat next to him in a restaurant. And I'm like, what is his name? It's like, oh, it's that guy. So even he, that level gets that. But yeah, for, for you yeah. know, there's a lot of household name act. I don't also tell people what I do because then they think I do children's parties or something like that. And yeah. uh, by the way, to your point, you're right. You know, performing and making a career is can be validating regardless the nonsense that you experience doing cruise ship review show is the same nonsense that it's experienced in a broadway show now sure broadway has some sort of industry uh stamp of approval attached to that but that's your own psychosis to deal with same with um yeah. you know comedy or anything else there are plenty of variety acts that have made a huge living that are well known in their industry that are not household names so you really just kind of have to and some of those guys you're... some of those guys are actually making more money than oh. people whose names you you recognize because you see him on you've seen him on every tv show do one episode on every tv show and you're like oh you feel like you know him oh for sure but again they do one tv show episode a year where these some of these variety acts are doing 50 to 75 shows a year at 10 to 15 grand a pop, you know what I mean? So, yeah. so a lot of them are, are making more money, even though they're not quote unquote famous I, or right. I always unquote, successful. Made, right, I always made good money later on because I, I create, created an act that just happened to be, you know, so, solid uh, and, and pretty much able to handle almost all audiences. There are a few that I won't do because they make me uncomfortable and I don't like them. Um, or it's just not my thing as I get older. Um, yeah, there was something else I wanted to say about that. But yeah, ba ba oh, I know what I was going to say. So, you know, and the AGT thing, by the way, you know, I never wanted to do it. Uh, they'd asked me for many, many years, as they do many acts. Um, I yeah, because knew... the singers and stuff keep coming, but ventriloquists, all those variety acts, there's actually not that many people who can do them and a lot of well, those the, the, shows the, compete the is, for good the months. issue is that you know that format well first of all what they wanted from me was a very limited scope of what i really do you know in my act it's a variety show and the puppets are just dressing to the act yeah. i am an improv stand-up first and with the audience and uh kind of like an mc kind of yeah. guy and that lots of audience interaction a lot, a lot which i don't know what i'm going to do covid wise after this, there's a lot of discussion going on about that, but, but, you know, so they just wanted a puppet, the puppets, which I knew, and I'm not like, I don't bill my, they bill me as a ventriloquist. I mean, like cruise ships and all that, because there's a million comedians and that's yeah. easily sellable, but, yeah. um, you know, I don't, have a million, I, don't have, I don't do a million characters. I don't have a million props and gadgets and, and all, all that kind of stuff. It's just not what I'm interested in. And so I knew that I would only be utilized once or twice on that show, I also knew that they would, as surprisingly a lot of people don't know, you know, some of it's real and some of it is produced and some of it is produced reality. So I knew that mm -hmm. they'd lowered the boom in editing it in, in some way. From a business uh, standpoint, there were positive things about it, but there were negative things too, like P 
people think that the two minutes you did on primetime network television is what your whole 55 minute act is going to be. So, which is absurd. Why would it be that? You know, no. that, you can't do the same and, thing. For, and usually like, especially in your show, it's not even necessarily the best two minutes of that 55 and people think you're bringing your, your hot stuff, but right. especially so, or they the think first act, you got to save your best stuff in case you do make it to the finals. So, right. Yeah. Or like that one of the judges said, by the way, I'm not a children's performer. Like I have had kids in my act and I know how to do that, but I am not a children's performer. That is not my audience. I don't like it. Uh, but if someone brings their kid and they're not disruptive, I will talk to them and make, make a meal out of that. You know, that's yeah. probably a bad metaphor dealing with an adult with a child. But PSA, uh, don't eat children. Right, um, right. You know, but you know, one of, the one of the judges said, you know, visually my son would love this act. And so then I got, countless calls for children's, children's shows gigs. that I had to turn down, you know, or, um, you know, they think I'm very wholesome and I get calls to do like the Latter-day Saints or a room full of born again Christians or whatever. I'm like, you do not want me. I am not the act for you. <laughs> Just lazy. Oh man. So uh, let's kick it back to a little bit. I, I obviously people, know you for the last what year and a half um but let's talk a little bit more about you just the the actual length of the career that you've had and then we'll talk a little bit more about your your covid pivots um but you toured with some some big names can we there's two names that, that stuck out to me as i was kind of reading um for the record we I, I mentioned that i was gonna talk about your book uh in what 2014 i guess you probably it, it was published in 14 i think so it was 2015 um, there's a book that you wrote called Breaking Out of Show Business, What I've Discovered by Not Being Discovered. And it's, it's fun. It's, it's encouraging. It's lots of little stories of just the life of a working actor and comedian um, who has stories about Ray Romano and, and all these people. But it's also kind of a, um, God, it's a, it's a textbook almost of any young performer or parents of young performers should read it because it's, it's, this is, this is what the life actually is. Like, if you want to do this fine, but here's what it looks like and stuff. So it's, but mostly it's just a lot of, it's a collection of a lot of fun stories and, and lessons that you've learned and all those sorts of things. I mean, they've got chapters in there uh, called uh, which are again, each chapter is just kind of the title of, of the story that you go on to tell, which is a lot of fun, but like, I should have stolen that Grammy howdy doody ruined my life. Japan didn't have mac and cheese, and the day Ben Affleck almost kicked my ass. Uh, so it's a lot of <laughs> it's a lot of those types of things. So uh, you know that old out, chestnut. You know. Yeah, that old chestnut. Yeah. Uh, lots of stories uh, that that most of us would kill to have just one of these stories to tell at a party, and he's got like forty of them. But that being said, um, a couple of the names that really stuck out to me, other than Ben Affleck, uh, were Jim Henson and Don Brickles. So. <laughs> I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about as a puppeteer working with, you know, probably the most famous puppeteer of all time, uh, working for him, working um, just kind of, let's start with just kind of talk about that process and what that was like. And if that was uh, as cool as I think it sounded like it was. Sure. So uh, first of all, everyone I've opened for is dead. Um, so, you know, the, the, there was a time when acts, big acts had opening acts. And now no one really pays for that anymore. They just have the location, find some local guy to go up there or some radio DJ or whatever. So I was really lucky that I came in kind of at the tail end of that. Um, but now when someone reads off my credits, I'm like, yep, they're all dead. So, but as far as Jim Henson goes, um, I always love puppetry. I, you know, people think puppetry is a children's medium and it's, it's really not, you know, it's special effects and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And people think you're just shaking a doll and going like this, but there is a nuance to it to make it seem alive and make it seem real. And there's a lot of bad puppetry out there, a lot. Um, so, yeah, I mean, your puppets have, have tons of mechanisms and stuff. It's not, a, it's not a sock that you threw on your left hand. It's a Which, by it's the a way, machine, a sock, a complicated a sock works machine. To, well, the gymnast, uh, world's oldest gymnast is, uh, a customized mechanism. Usually eye mechanisms when you have a blinker in a puppet, well, in a TV puppet, when you're holding the puppet above your arm into the camera shot, those cables come down through the body and you control that down here 
Um, they're usually not built into the head, but some of them have a slider in them, like uh, the great Gonzo has the, he can wiggle mm -hmm. his eye, you know. Yeah. But, there, but there's no one way to do those builds. So yeah, she has that, but like the bird of prey character that I do, um, it's not very elaborate, um, but there are, I could do a whole dissertation on what makes a good puppeteer. And a lot of people just don't do it. And a lot of ventriloquists, like I hate ventriloquism, uh, only because it's usually done so, so poorly. It's either set up punchline, set up, I'm getting, I'm not even answering your question now. I'm going on my own. Not even line. a little bit, but go Sorry. for it. I okay, love let's it. Let's go back to Jim Henson. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So like everybody else <laughs> that was a kid, uh, I was crazy about Sesame Street. Um, yeah. Not so much for the learning side of it, but I was really looking at the puppets. I'm like, oh, even as a child, I'm like, okay, that there's several things moving there. That's more than one person. Where are they? Or, hey, I think I just saw the top of someone's head. Or, hey, big inside Big Bird, how tall is that guy? How's the other hand moving? All that kind of stuff. And I was a toddler. In fact, I was so Jewish that I was already worrying that I wouldn't grow up fast enough before I could learn to drive to get to New York to audition the show before it was canceled and went off the air. Yeah, so spoiler not, alert, uh, you, you made it in time. They're still yeah, doing Sesame Street. So, <laughs> I mean, the 50, they just celebrated like their 50th uh, season. So yeah, we're okay. But um, so what happened was, my parents and I went to MGM Studios, Florida for a vacation and we're on the tram car and it's going past the production offices. And the guy says, I'm to our left. These production offices are being rented out by Jim Henson production. I literally jumped off this tram car as it was moving. And I went under the fence and I told my parents, I'll meet you at the end of the thing. And you know, it was before 9-11. So there was like not a lot of heavy security. I walked right into the office, which by the way, this precipitated uh, then years of me breaking into places where I didn't belong, hence the TV st station and a bunch of other places. So wait, uh, how I'm, old are you in this story? I must have been like six, oh, no, I was younger. I must have been like 14? I don't know. It was 1990, uh, when did they open MGM Studios? I don't know. I was the like, point is I could have been 13, 14, 15, somewhere around there. Okay. And I walk into the office and I'm like, oh, I'm here to see Jim Henson. And the woman's like, who the hell are you? Uh, they're like, oh, he's not here right now. And I get ready to leave. And he walks in with another man who I later was his, I kind of was his uh, executive producer. And I'm like, oh, Mr. Henson, I'm a puppeteer. I'm going to work with you. He's like, oh, I'm really looking forward to that. You know, like that. And we're talking for a minute and he gives me his address, the office address in New York. And he says, write, write to me because there was no emails or anything. Yeah. So I'm like losing my mind. Yeah, I don't know what to say. As you guy, should. You know? So I write him. It's handed off to some administrator and they write me a letter and invite me up to New York to the workshop to look around and, you know, spend the day and whatever. So I do that. And after that, they pay for my bus ticket once a month or whatever to come up for like a year. Then that, so but I never puppeteered with him or anything like that, but you know, I was, he was around. So then that ended and they really do a lot of outreach for kids. So I'm sure they said, okay, he had his chance. Now let's give it to someone else or whatever. And then nothing else happened after that. Uh, then quite a few years later when I'm already in act, they were getting ready to audition the, the Muppets. The Muppet Show had the Muppet Show Muppets had been sold to a German company and they were going to start the Muppet Show again and they were casting. And I became friends with uh, Carol Spinney, who was the original Big Bird and also the Grouch, who just passed away this year, has a great Netflix special called I Am Big Bird about being one of the most famous characters in the world. And, you know, no one knows, who but he's is. invisible. No one knows who he is. Carol and, Spinney, I Am Big Bird. That's, oh, yeah, gosh. it's great. It is great. So, but anyway, to, I'll try to wrap it up. Basically, Carol sent me to that audition and then Carol invited me to Sesame Street when Jim Henson had passed away and a bunch of the, and Frank Oz had started directing and they were looking for other puppeteers. So uh, I came in, he helped me get that job. Um, we're all independent contractors. Uh, it was great, but it was hard. Uh, it's, it's a little like Game of Thrones 
there, um, to be honest with you. The, it, I always think it's funny, like the show that teaches about sharing and caring and being nice to people is like- Cutthroat behind the scenes. It is fucking cutthroat. It really is. And that was right before the whole Elmo scandal. <laughs> Who gets to and, sit on the Elmo throne? Yeah. Right. And, you know, in the book, um, I would be remiss if I had not talked about my experience with the company. And, you know, it ended early late, late, because of something that I, I won't talk about that had nothing to do with me. I was, it was a victim of circumstance, but later I was, um, uh, exonerated. Exonerated. Thank you. Because of the Elmo, it was, it had nothing to do with children. Basically I butted heads a lot with Kevin Clash. That's basically what it was. So he didn't want there to we go. That, that's what it was. So, um, yeah, I had more time there than some less than others. Vindicated. Let's go. I was vindicated. vindicated. That's right. That's a better um, word. Thank you. So it was a great experience. Um, it was, I remember my, uh, I mean, the first day I walk in and the wrangler is like the puppet wrangler who handles all the characters. The main characters are kept at the studio in a private room. And they go, the girl goes, I understand you want to see, you want to go to the room. I'm like, yeah. Let's go to the room. And everyone thinks there's many duplicates of, of the Muppet characters and they, there aren't. Sometimes there's two. Now Elmo, because he's so famous, there's like six. One where, where he can ride a tricycle and one full body and one half body. But for the most part, there's only been like three cookie monsters. And when you open up the tab, there's something sewn in that says cookie number two, you know, or something like that. Wow. So you go in the room and she goes, who do you want to see? I'm like, I don't know who's here. And it was great. Um, it's hard oh because when you, generally with the Muppets, you spend the first couple of years, you're like a butterfly, you're sheep number five. You might right hand if it takes two hands. Uh, you don't really, you rarely get a legacy character. But during that time, there was a lot of flux with everybody. And a lot of turnover, I yeah. did get to do Burton Grover a little bit here and there. At times, I did the Grouch. Um, I don't have a great Grouch, which I was primarily a Grover and a few other things. And, you know, they want you to be not enamored with they want you to relax and like be be cool but then they want you to be respectful of the characters at the same time so it's kind of a hard yeah. balance and they that and, would be yeah and my my first couple of days they razz me and they they uh put me through the ringers which i talk about in the book where they tried to uh what's it called when when you're in a fraternity they haze you yeah so so i got some hazing and that was fun and i you know I'm still in the alum, alumni group, so they send me the cast jackets and all that stuff. And I, I have some memorabilia that I took with me, um, you know, and that's that. Gosh, that what a, a fun, very what long a story. Fun. You'll have to edit that. No, I'm leaving it. Uh, what a fun just time. And, and, okay, kids, don't climb under fences and don't break any laws. No. But the idea that you got a lot of those things from just taking a chance and reaching out to the right people and having the audacity to walk in and say, I'm the MC Jim Henson. Oh, yeah. Like reach out. Like the yeah, people. I, I used to pretend to be my own, uh, my own uh, assistant. That's amazing. That's amazing. I dressed up like a courier. It's in the book. I dressed up like a courier when I was pitching shows and I couldn't get in places. And I dressed up like a courier with a fake clipboard. And I go uh, to William Morris and like, uh yeah i'm dropping off for austin morris they go all right we'll take it i'm like he has to sign for it or someone in his office they're like this is william morris and i'd be like congratulations from courier express and i have 10 more stops to make today and they didn't know what to do so they'd send me up to the 18th floor he'd sign for it you know take your jacket off in the elevator and be like hi I'm michael no I, i'd have i'd be all scruffy <laughs> they, the guy would sign for it i'd leave then i get a call for a meeting i shave and put on clean clothes and go to the meeting so yeah you got to take Hilarious. risks. And there's really nobody that can tell you how to do that. People are like, well, how do I have a comedy career? How do I have a singing career? The rules are different for everybody. What your personality yeah. is, what the situation is, who you're trying to pitch. There are certain, you know, things you can know about branding and being the most yourself and, uh, you know, no, especially in today's world, the social media aspect of it all and those sorts of things. But a lot of it is just, again, knowing the right people and having the, it is the uh, i'm going to use the word audacity again but audacity is usually uh, used in a negative light but I, I love it like having the the backbone the spine the the 
audacity to walk up to somebody and say, Hey, I'm here to see Jim Henson or just right. email and, somebody, but, email somebody, DM and, somebody and, on Instagram and be like, and Hey, I want to do this. Can I work? That's with right. You? That's right. I, I'm sorry. There was a delay for a minute. Yeah. The, you're right. There also has to be a difference between self-worth and ego, mm. right? You don't want to, and, and, and acting like you're experienced when you're not, or that you're in, not interested when you are. And also some humility, like, some people think it's terrible when you say, look, I don't know anything. I really want to work for you. You know, here's what I've done. Would you talk to me about it? You know, some people are like, well, that really kind of hurts your brand because you're trying to put, no, some people can smell bullshit. And unfortunately, our area of entertainment has a lot of that. People PR themselves to death and a lot of the PR is fake. Um, yeah. I, I can't tell you how many magicians call them or singers, they call themselves, they were voted singer of the year. Really? From who? Your mother? Um, oh, hey, and and grandma. That, there was a yeah, majority. One, yeah. one of them actually said to me, oh, I just say that. So, you know, um, but, you know, in the beginning, What's... you have to BS a little, just like any resume. If you want to work in the healthcare field and you have no experience, Okay, you fudge your resume a little bit. You you creatively know. words the truth. What's I think it's a Larry Bird quote. Uh, I'll have to look it up later, but I think it's a Larry Bird quote. Um, says, "You can talk shit, but you better back up at least eighty percent of it." Well, that's exactly right. And like, I think that's I, a like you can you can fudge a little bit, but you can't do it too much. You got to be self aware to know where's my eighty percent, and then and then maybe maybe talk a little on top of that. Yeah. And also like I used to go, if I had to talk to someone, like I, I wanted to get to someone that was really imp like important in the industry, I'd go on IMDb, I'd look them up and IMDb lists your degrees of separation from that person. So if, Genius. right. So then I call, I write a letter and I say, I worked on this production, but we never got to meet because I was a shy kid or because I worked on opposite days or I worked with so-and-so and she felt we might want to blah, blah, blah. So I kind of would fudge it that way. I know. I'm a genius. That's great. Especially for, for a young performer or somebody like I, we just talked about, or I just said like DM somebody on Instagram, but do, do 10, if, if it's somebody you respect and somebody you want to work with, respect them enough to do 10 minutes worth of research on them and, and understand right. who they are, do your homework. And, and if, if that's the other thing is you never know how many of those people, especially if you've got a few credits, if you, if you're starting out, but you've done a couple things, I guarantee, uh, what's the six degrees of Kevin Bacon? Like, find, yeah. find that and mention and, it. Like, personalize and By the it. way, people in general don't, if you want someone to help you, you don't say to them, where do I belong in your company or can I come work for you or what can I, you know, I, I, you tell them why you belong in their company. Gosh, um, I saw, this is, this is digressing so much, but I, we've kind of, because we're both performers, we've tied a lot of this to performance, but most of this, most of this goes for any industry, just reach out and, and do the research and, and all those things. I read a letter from um, Barbara Corcoran. Uh, it's on the internet. I, I, I'll, pro I'll try to link it uh, in the show notes, um, but there's a letter that apparently Barbara Corcoran wrote to Mark Cuban when she found out that they had gone with Lori, I guess, over her. And the letter she sent was incredibly respectful saying, you know, I, I think you made the wrong choice. Here's why I belong there. Here's the research I've done. And I've already bought my ticket to the next round of auditions for your show. Please don't, please don't make me cancel it. Or however, it was just, it was incredibly, it was the best thing I've seen that was self-aware, respectful, humble, and yet here's why I belong here. And here's why you're making mistakes. So I'll, I'll try to, it, reading that was just, was just fantastic. And it's a little bit of what you, what you talked about, just be self-aware. Right. And you won't, but you only know what you know. Like there are many, yeah. many times when I thought I was ready for something, like I sent a pitch to someone or I, I, uh, my act tape or whatever. But then you look at it two years later, you're like, that wasn't great. That hit the mark a little bit. I wasn't ready. But yeah. we don't know that. And you still, that doesn't mean you can't keep trying. You only know what you know. You, you just got to push through. Right. Um, that actually, uh, actually, before we move on, I mentioned Don Rickles earlier. Oh, and yeah, I'm sorry. sorry. Don Rickles is one of my favorite people on the planet. Like his old stand-up, uh, him like ribbing presidents, and he could just get away with anything. And it was amazing. For, and 
for those of you uh, my age or younger, Don Rickles is the voice of Mr. Potato Head. Uh, <laughs> Um, but uh, luckily, I grew up in a, in a family that just loved old music and, and old comedians and old TV shows. So I, I was lucky enough to grow up around a lot of those things. But you, one of the comedians you've toured with was yeah. Don Rickles. And uh, I think he's one of those people like Bill Murray or whoever that everyone who's worked with him has at least one good story. So I'm going to ask if you have a good Don Rickles story for us. Yeah. Uh... <laughs> First of all, he's super nice. Like if he ever thought he hurt your feelings, he would be very upset. I mean, not now because he's dead, but back then. Um, I well, the one story I the I do talk about how I met him the first time. I, well, I met him when I did the Tonight Show, but we didn't really get to talk. And then many years later, I was touring with Joan Rivers, and she was in the same town I was working on another show, and she was split billing with Don. So after the show, so cool. after the show, before the show, I come backstage and we're, she, we're talking. She's like, do you want to go meet Don? I'm like, yeah, I want to meet Don. You know, he's like, hurt from Rat Pack and you know, whatever, you know, yeah. that whole time period, whatever. And I'm not usually starstruck most of the time. But we walk in and he is watching a football game and he's, he's wearing like a crushed red velvet robe with the insig his insignia and like a tuck shirt and that's open and he's like eating some fruit or whatever. And... Uh, you know, and we start talking, she introduces me and he's like, oh yeah, right, the puppet that fought. The puppet was funny, you not so much, you know. And we're sitting there and we're, <laughs> and we're watching the game and finally I couldn't help myself. I go, you know, Mr. Rickles, you're really the reason I got into show business. And he said, well, that was a mistake. What's on channel two? Um, and then right in front of me, he and Joan were kind of going at it. Um, he... Was there, there was a couple other times where he, oh, I know. So <laughs> I'm sitting there with him and he's very good friends with Bob Newhart, who is another ancient actor. Yeah. But he had like three TV series. And so he's like, well, and we're on, we're on tour and Bob is, is going to join us for dinner. So Bob goes to the bathroom and he comes back to the table and Don looks at me and he goes, tell him to his face. <laughs> now fortunately bob knows what don bob knows doing. don enough yeah right, yeah, yeah. Exactly. so it's little things like that you know. so fun that's so fun um thank you for that that's I, uh, well i were i was lucky because that era of show business and performing you know they, they didn't travel with a big entourage and they really just wanted to work there wasn't a lot of bullshit and they really didn't think that they had any coattails to ride on they really had that depression mentality that tomorrow the call wasn't going to come in and that there's yeah. something very refreshing about that just always on but like like you said nice for someone for someone who made his career insulting people it's 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 always fun to hear people talk about how nice he actually he was right now meanwhile <clears throat> you know he would blush at the things lisa lampanelli would say who i also worked with uh toured with and he's like I, i'm like do you want to go see her he's like no the cursing i can't like she talked about vulgar women things you know, and that really bothered, you know, he, it's not his generation. And yet yeah. he was her, I mean, well, that's not true. He, she, she was, she was more like Red Fox, Richard Pryor, you know, like yeah. the, the Dirty Party albums. And he wasn't really bad, I guess, but yeah, it was close. But still, he, he pushed the envelope for his time. That's for sure. Yeah. Every um, band stereotype. <clears throat> yeah. So, so uh, thank you for that. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, <clears throat> I look forward to recording podcasts in the future where we don't talk about COVID, but yeah. it's 2020. Uh, and you, uh, of all the people that I, that I know and, and follow, um, have had one of the coolest <clears throat> pivots or additions uh, to your career. Uh, again, jack of all trades, you've added another feather in your cap over the last few months, and you've started a production company uh, that's just kind of taken off almost on accident. So I'd love yeah. to just hear you talk a little bit about ACM Productions and how that started sure. and what you've been doing. So I haven't worked this hard since I started building my act 30 years ago. Um, it has been a tremendous undertaking. Is it fun uh, to work that hard again, though? Uh, it depends on what it is. Um, there are aspects of it that I've never had to deal with that I hate. Mm -hmm. um, but that seems to be smoothing itself out as we bring other people on board. So over the years, I've always had also had a production career and that generally was either script writing for people, joke writing, or 
directing uh, maybe the show process of different entertainers, one person shows, um, and the occasional TV and things like that. A very small sect of that was something that really only happens in California, which is we have award show season here, uh, People's Choice, SAG, uh, the Globes, the Oscar, all yeah, those things so happen many. around the same time period. And because that's when all the celebrities come to town and they can have access to them. To piggyback that, there is also charity show season. And they built that around the same time period when all the celebrities are in town so they can fundraise their national galas uh, and rope in big names. Because you know they're there already. Correct. Yeah. And it's good PR for the celebrities and all that kind of stuff. And if you say, I'm going to honor Morgan Freeman at our Big Brothers and Big Sisters Gala as Man of the Year, then all of his famous people come and so do the press. So it's a very strange, small niche of production. It's not really show business. It's kind of corporate and, and entertainment entwined. It's a lot of, yeah. you know, they do all, but a lot of times they shoot like it's a three camera shoot. There's big IMAG screens. Um, so you're calling a show music and speeches and all that, but you're also calling cameras and things like that. So it's a charity like, convention masquerading as show business for they one mask it as year. an award show there's teleprompters and all this stuff they have footage in case they want to you know issue it to entertainment tonight or whatever but it's kind of a nightmare because the clients are organizations they're not show people mm -hmm. um so they're not organized they also all think because they're saving the world that they can be disorganized and terrible and rude uh they nickel and dime you left and right and the event producers are really just chicken dinners, auction items, getting fundraising people, they're, they're not production. So they'll put together all the elements of the show, the graphics, the videos and all that. And then they come to the crew and the director like that day or the day before, and then we have to make it look like something which makes them think they did an amazing job when it looks great, but it's really us doing it, fixing about 80% of the bullshit that they created. So um, these are the people during COVID that started calling me and the, some of the other people I work with. We still need to fundraise. Everyone's doing virtual stuff. It's Zoom and terrible and not professional. What do we do? And so, you know, my, my now partners came together and said, we don't know how long COVID's going to go on. All, all of my work was canceled. Um, we should do something with this. And we started getting off deposits before we even like had a bank account or a name or knew exactly how we were going to really execute all of this, you know, at the same time. So it also meant that we, uh, we had to pitch people. So we had to come up with PowerPoint decks and explain to them how things are done. And, you know, we didn't really know what things we should be responsible for and what we shouldn't. So we probably took on too much. And mm -hmm. I'm dealing with the angst of the, clients and doing the creative and while someone else dealt with the technical also partnerships how do you work as a partnership you know it's everything and it was an absolute bucket of valium daily needed shit show circus for about three months where i was working morning till night multi talk about knowing a little bit of everything multitasking from technical parameters to you know, the talent to the crew, to the scripting, to the branding, to the, the, the platforms, all that stuff. And a lot of it, I don't know anything about. One of our guys do, and, but the selling, being a salesperson line, like before I was just yeah. hired as a director, all the stuff was purchased or I told them what they needed, what kind of equipment we needed for the stage, the lights or the control room, and they would do that. Now we have to sell all that equipment and explain to them why we need it. And they all think you're trying to build them. Can you tell it's frustrating? So anyway, it all took off. Uh, we did a bunch of those shows first. Uh, we still have a few more to do. Some of them are cool, like we're doing this National Holocaust Museum live stream special uh, in October. Yeah. And we have like a million stars. And, we, um, you know, a lot of it's COVID. So you try to get the celebrities to do what you want if it's pre-recorded. And it, I think it's, and there's some of the story packages that are going to be absolutely amazing, which I love. Wow. Uh, and a few others. And the others are hard. And then we're also doing um, 2D and 3D environments for corporate conventions and trade shows and 
company meetings, which is not sexy, but if I, if we throw any type of show business into refreshing what they're doing, they're thrilled. They have the money to do it. And, but we are still working within the confines of COVID. So, you know, if we're not sending a crew and they're not paying for satellite or a private broadband system, we are having the networks, the television networks are having the same issues that we are as a small company, which is amazing that we're all like back to zero. You know, when you have a pixelated yeah, image so of somebody or something like that, there's only so much control you have. So anyway, in a nutshell, that, that, that's what's going on. Um, I don't know that I'll go back to performing. I am preparing for it in case I have to, because I, it's not, I don't know. It's still a very new company. So it's not, yeah. money is coming in, but it's not consistent. <clears throat> we're still building and we're getting good names and all that, but I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. So you, so, this is, this is crazy for there. There's so many I'm astounded by and encouraged by and very, very, um, just excited by all the the new company. I'm calling them COVID companies. I want to make a sticker or like a, a get a TM, like uh, just all the people who have had this time to start things like your company or this podcast or all these things that the people have wanted to do and finally have, have branched out and are doing. Um, but it this guy, cool. what you were like filming you said, with. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just want to say, you know, as someone who has worked for themselves for years, and mm -hmm. other people, but as an independent contractor, like there were things that were hard to get used to, like when to turn off my computer and stop looking yeah. at my phone. I had to take my work, some of my work email off my phone. You know, what, two days for a weekend, that sucks after working all week. How did the civilians deal with that for the last 30 years that I never had yeah. to deal with? You know, it is bad. I hate it. Yeah, wait, I have to start working before 8 p.m.? No. What? <laughs> I even got up, you know, even just to get out of my house, you know, I bought a bicycle to go take a ride, to clear my head. Uh, because Gosh. I, now I understand why after a work day, no one wants to talk to their, call me on the phone. I'm like, oh, you never call me. Now I know why, I don't wanna talk to anybody. Exhausted, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, that sounds, that sounds like a lot of fun. I just, I mean, this is, this is somebody who, this is somebody who has, like I said, like you said, have technically worked for yourself for the better part years. of your career. Yeah, right. Um, your adult life and, uh, who's starting a company and what a couple weeks ago you were shooting with Henry Winkler like these and uh, and still your company you're like man I don't really know what what's next I don't really know it's it's kind of interesting you've almost had your your performance career become your side hustle it's almost changed I, you know it's funny I I wanted I was feeling yeah you know, the reason I wrote the book was because I was ready to quit uh, I hit my ceiling. I couldn't figure out where I belonged or what I wanted to do next. I hated the venues. I hated the money. I hated the, you know, the nickel and diming of it all. And uh, I was frustrated. And the, the publishing company asked me, they heard about me and asked me to write this book. And I had said, who is going to care? Oh, by the way, this is the book. Who is going to care about a show business book from somebody that nobody knows? My career is not going to help you sell books. And they said, that is what we think is so funny. So. Um, so now, uh, for the career, now that I haven't touched the act in months, I'm nervous Missing about it. doing it again, but I've, I've, I've kind of written a few new things and I, I think I would be interested in doing it again. And I know I will have to, and I'm available to do that. You know, we all have to pay our bills. Um, but if I was, I don't mind not being on the road anymore. You know, I really yeah. don't. Yeah. That's a that's a big part of it. A lot of a lot of performers that we both know, uh, who are on the road, you know, forty weeks a year, are like, you know what? As as terrible as this is, all of my gigs are canceled. I don't know where money's coming from. But at the end of the day, I haven't seen my family. Me personally, I haven't seen my family this much in five years. So there, there, you do kind of have to um, you do kind of have to take the good with the bad and and all those sorts this of things. This pandemic has been great for me. Like I hate to say that, but it really taught me, it, it stopped everything and there's a lot of self-care going on, yeah. a lot of uh, internally and externally. And that was great. And I've been looking for the right life preserver to transition me. Yeah. So I wasn't so much one foot in, one foot out. And I'm, I think this could be it. I, I don't know how long it'll last. I, don't, I feel like something good is happening here. It's not where I would like it to be long-term, but it's still the beginning. And I would, I would like to go back and act again now, now that I'm an adult, yeah. adult and I know how to do it. Like when I did all those movies, like I didn't know what I was doing. I, I don't even know how I got those jobs. And I would like to 
go back to all of yeah, that. Yeah, we talked about we talked about Broadway. If anybody who knows anybody over at Telsey or or any of the big ones, uh, Cameron McIntosh needs a character actor. Call Michael Paul, man. He's uh yeah. he's the real deal. Um, is it exciting? I mean, I don't want I don't, I don't want to put your business out there, but you know, I would say you're a year or two older than me. So is it fun at this point in your life being able to start? Um, start something new like people yes, feel like I, they're too old to start something new and here you are starting a not just a small new etsy shop not just a small little side hustle which i think are amazing by the way if you crochet and you're not selling it go for it it could be fun but if people say all the time i'm too old to start that and here you are at in your in your early 30s uh or whatever you are um complete new chapter that i have to be 49 be by the way there you go there that was very nice. I didn't want to ask, but you I don't, know, I don't care. It's fine. Uh, although I am getting the old man neck, it's starting to come. And I'm like, I, I mm. can't. I'm just going to wear, I like wearing the mask. Because when you pull it down over your, under your neck, it's like a neck hammer. Yo, I don't, a beard, man. Please. I've, got, I've got a weird double chin. It's not an old man neck, but it's, when I get old man neck, it's going to come right. hard. So yeah, wow. the beard can't is, wait to is see very that. helpful. Call me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So is it exciting? I will say, you know, every change I made in my life was out of, Look, generally it's not a necessity. I mean, if you are unhappy with where you are at, uh, I was almost psychotic about it. Like I could not, if I had an idea to get myself out of that, I would get to the computer and I'd be up all night working on that before I could go to bed. You know, no one's going to get me out of that situation except me. So yep. these are all necessities to not, cause, but some people are not strong enough or can't see the way out. And they just are stuck for 30 years. And there are choices, but, but are they choices you're willing to make and decide the bad and the good? I mean, the things that I complained about being an act that I hated are really the same things that suck in this job. It's just in a different mm -hmm. wrapping. So pick which one, which bag of rocks yeah. you want to carry and get, stop doing the one foot in, one foot out and just commit to it. Well, yeah, and, and there's, there's a, a tough balance there because you don't want to fall into the um the grass is always greener thing and like start something new just to start something new but at the same time if you're not happy what's what's the harm in in trying yes. something what's what's interesting is sometimes you have to take a step back sometimes you have to live in a smaller house for a couple of years to afford the other things but covid has kind of made us all take a step back and all of our jobs were canceled you know what i mean so it, it's it's almost a forced life change but you can do that at any point and just take a step and say you know what i'm not I'm not super happy right. with you, you can that. Have all the, right, you can have all the excuses in the world of why you're not going to change it. And they, those might be true, but you could still step through the fire and do it anyway. Or, and I think a lot of people are spoiled. Like for, 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 for me in this job right now, because it's an upstart, uh, a startup job, I would say it's 30% creative and 70% work. But to the civilians in the world, that's how it normally is for people. So yeah. you find your creativity after work or you get up early or whatever. So if you're feeling like you can't make a change, then you need to add other things into your life. Like when I was sick of the touring and, and all of that, and it really, you know, I was unhappy. When I started doing other things, it demagnified that and made it more pal palatable. So yeah. there's always that. There, that's, and you put it, uh, People ask me what right-brained realism is, and um, it's not something I've, I've fully defined yet because it's a, a phrase that I created. Uh, but you just put it so well is, you know, you're starting something new. Any job, though, is, is there's so much creativity that goes along with building something or, or making something, it, literally creating something. But, but you also have to be very real about it. You have to well, put the right, work I mean in. Yeah, people make a choice for a change, and then like three steps in, they, my life is terrible, it sucks, I'm depressed. Yeah, right, because you're in the yeah. middle of the evolution. Give yourself a chance to get through the process. You chose to steer this ship in a new direction, so Commit. stop murdering Work. yourself over it. Yeah, and you also made a really great point of sometimes you have to learn when too much work is too much. Like, I'm, I'm the same way of... I've not just this podcast, but I've got a couple other projects that I'm working on and writing. And man, sometimes I'll look up and it's 4 a.m. and I'm in the middle of an idea. And then two days later, I'm being kind of short tempered with people. And I'm like, oh, oh, I'm not sleeping enough. Oh, I'm not 
I'm working yep. too hard. Oh, I haven't. Yep. Oh, I'm burnt out. I hate this now because I've been working on it 140 hours a week or whatever for for two weeks. I need a day. And so there there's um there is such a thing as working too hard, but you still have to put the work in. Right. I think that you know. I mean, I forgot the first couple of months of this. I forgot to eat because I was working. Like I would yes. not feel one. I'm like, oh, I hadn't eat. And I think that um. You know, I. I think self-care is super important as long as you know yourself well enough to know that you're not going to be lazy and take advantage of the time that you have. You know, a lot yeah. of people think they're doing a lot of work and they're kicking up a lot of dust and then it settles and they haven't really done any work. Gosh. So I wish, I wish I could do that. My angst will not allow it. Yeah. Yeah. There's, 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 um, too much to do. Like there's so much yeah. world and there's to build and there's so many good ideas to have and, but that, that being said, like, like if I'm putting myself through the ringer about it, sometimes I have to be a little morbid and think, okay, this is upsetting me. Is this, am I going to care about this when I'm almost dead? And usually the answer is no. So it puts it in perspective. And, yeah. you know, I've lived in California for 13 years now after New York, and I probably went to the beach twice. I've been to the beach like three times in a, in a month, at COVID-friendly, safe beach. Uh, but, but I've been three times, and it's, it's great and makes my day feel better and refreshed uh you know to to work all night again you know? yeah yeah it's great yeah the um after pulling an all-nighter and like then sleeping till one o'clock being able to like take a day and go out and do something or sometimes i'll go um sit by lake hefner a, a, a lake here in oklahoma city still just going and sitting you know outside with with a with a book and because you you can like work from anywhere. If we've learned anything in 2020, it's that you don't have to be tied to your office or your desk. You can go outside, go to the beach. Even if you do go to the beach with the book a you book? have to read that day, a with book, book working out of which showbiz, is on what I discovered Barnes and Noble and Amazon and also digital. There's a, there's yes, an I've got, I've, I've got the Kindle book, uh, edition, man, this has been great. We could do this for like nine hours. Uh, you're always uh, fun to talk to. And, um, thank you. So we're going to, uh, pivot a little bit into the, the end of show questions. Oh. Um, just to be respectful of your time, we'll, we'll, we'll get these it's rapid fire questions way past out. That. And, uh, way past, way past yeah. that. So, uh, past. well, you had so much good stuff to say and I had to get the Rickle story in. So what were you gonna do? Uh, if you had a time machine, you can go back and witness one event from history, you can't change anything. Where would you go, when would you go, and why? Uh, I think I would like to see, oh. It's terrible, and I don't know why I want to see it. I just so it hits close, close to home. When black people in the Old South went and sat down at the diner to, you know, yeah. prove that they have a right to be there, uh, the Civil Rights Movement. I not that I'd like to be a part part of it, or not that I'd like it to be different, but that kind of uh, courage and uh, fortitude uh, and humility. Uh, I, I don't know why I, I just thought of that, but yeah, I think I would like to witness just that. Just be kind in of the diner and, and watch. Witness that, that kind of hu major humanity. Event. I mean, obviously yeah. the negative side to that hurts me deeply, but yeah, of course, but uh, I'd like to witness that kind of strength and humanity that I don't really see a lot anymore. Man, I, yeah, I, you know, this is, uh, a great question and all the answers I've gotten have been fantastic, but of, of the answers that I've gotten, that's the first one that has given me chills, like thinking about sitting there and I don't know. Or my birth. To, I, if, if you don't want that one, we can go to my birth. Well, I don't want chills from that. That's fine. We can, uh, but just sitting and knowing what those, those counter sit-ins became and what they've meant to, to our history and the fight that we're still struggling with today. And, and, um, in a lot of ways is yeah, just witnessing that and seeing those people sit down and knowing that you were witnessing such an important event in American history. Yeah, okay, well, that's literally gave me goosebumps. Well, well, no, no, it's yours. I just think it was a great answer. Good job. Uh, what is one thing you wish had never been invented? Uh, probably uh, pizza. I would say pizza. Uh, I, is it because you eat too much of it or as a oh. Philly guy, you think, 
pizza gets too much credit and you want more people to eat cheese cheese sticks well i like it all um i like pizza a little too much i don't really eat a lot anymore because you know it, i really don't exercise enough to warrant eating that too much but also i mean i'll just take a whole pie i could if no one's around i would fold it in half and eat it like a sandwich like a taco but, man absolutely oh, the whole thing a gig, a lot large so maybe that yeah that's that's a good one. Um, yeah. I don't agree with you on that one. I certainly don't have chills for you trying to take pizza away, but I understand your reasoning. You would have chills uh, if you saw me eating one. That, there you go. Get in there. Uh, what is one book <laughs> other than Breaking Out of Show Business, what I've discovered by not being discovered by Michael Paul Zigfield? Uh, what is one book that has had an impact on your life that you encourage people to read? So many, many, many years ago, uh, in the 90s probably there was a book that came out called the celestine prophecy and it was before the secret and it was before oprah and it was before abraham hicks if you know who that is um and it was the theories of cause and effect and karma and deja vus and kind of universal energy type stuff kind of crunchy you know but it was yeah theories that were written within a fictitious story. And it talked about a level of participation and consciousness that I was just really ready to hear uh, as I moved into a, adulthood. <clears throat> and uh, it's still out. They did a sequel. Uh, I don't, it didn't, it wasn't that great, but it was a, it was a really one of those books that I had to read twice uh, to put notations. I'm like, Okay, that describes me. Okay, that's the answer to that. Yeah, yeah, it was a really good book. Oh, that's good. So one more time, the the, the Celestine, Celestine prophecy. Do you remember and who that's it, by? And it talks it about up. you know it's all about co things are being coincident uh, coincidences and actually the introduction to that book happened the same way. I'm in a rehearsal for a show. Someone's reading that book. I go, well, what is that book? And they said, oh, it's the Celestine prophecy. You can read it if you want when i'm finished i said great then i'm walking down the street meeting a friend and i walk past a bookstore and there's like a hundred of them in the window staring at me too then i go have lunch with that friend and we're talking about a level of spirituality he goes yeah it's just like the book the celestine i'm like okay i get it okay, i'll okay, buy yeah, it yeah. yeah uh by i don't know oh i just saw it uh james redfield the celestine okay. Celestine, C-E-L-E-S-T-I-N-E, -E -E, Prophecy by James Redfield. And of course, I'll put that in the show notes. Uh, that sounds like a lot of fun. I love that. Yeah. Um, I, try to, I try to do one of these questions that I kind of tailor to everybody. Uh, you, you are teaching now on Artists and Beyond, which is a platform that I have just started teaching on as well. Um, so you can find me on Artists and Beyond, but you'll probably, you, you might learn more from Michael. Uh, so as, as a new teacher, and we'll, we'll obviously link your description there. First of all, what are you teaching on there? Uh, sure. And then if you could give a 30 second thing that you want any young performer, parent of performer, or anybody that you just, some wisdom that you like to, to impart and leave them with. Um, if you could just impart one thing to the next generation of performers or, or their parents as they're bringing them up, what would that be? So uh, Artists and Beyond, you know, generally it's musical theater people. It's a good platform. Um, generally, I'm, I am hired to teach, uh, and I've been doing it for, for years uh, through my website. Um, as I said earlier, teaching like someone like yourself or an actor that wants to do a cabaret show, a one-man show, um, a concert, you know, where I direct their writing process. A lot of entertainers say, mm -hmm. this is what I'm going to call the show and this is the theme. And then when we flush it out, that's really not what it's about at all. Yeah. And kind of keeping people away from like bad patter and bad cabaret formatting and things like that. So a lot of times I help with the writing process and then later the directorial process of that production. Um, and so one Very of the fun. things I would say but, I, but I'm also called for, um, you know, I had a voiceover career, uh, a comedy career. I help people write comedy, uh, even people, even singers that want to be funny in their acts, you know. Um, punch it up a bit, yeah. There's a way to punch that up and things like that. So uh, what I would say to up and coming performers or performers that want to reinvent themselves is, and I touched on it a little bit earlier, is 
most people, when they're first designing something, they emulate who they like. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit of a mentorship, whether the other person knows it or not. It actually is harder to do that five years later when everyone's like, okay, you're doing what Austin does. Now come into your own, let it fall away and come into your own. And then you got to find yourself again. It would be mm -hmm. easier to start that way from the beginning. I experienced that mistake myself. Um, and the way you don't have to worry about being funny. You don't have to pick, pick a song in your repertoire because you sound good doing it. You don't have to do a bad pattern of, this is the song that my grandma loved before she died. None of that stuff. Uh, I know your eyes are getting big, but anything that we, that I've seen those shows if too you're times. looking for anything that will explain to you what your brand is as an unknown non-household name, why I want you to sing me the songs of Barry Manilow, you know, um, you know, then it, all that information comes from within. And if you can have someone help flush out the bits of who you are, the real bits of who you are and how you participate in the world, that gives you the comedy, it gives you the flow, it gives you the stories, it gives you the song. So I would say, talk to someone who you know really knows you and all of your angst. And the more you're willing to give up in embarrassment, the more it'll help you. I'm not talking about telling the audience things they don't need to hear about depression and things like that, unless you wanna talk yeah. about that. But any form of embarrassment and honesty and how you participate on this planet is the relatability that makes an audience love you. And that's not, and it's not, that's not, not to say to go too far into self-deprecation and all those things, but just being yourself and being authentic and sharing the parts of who you are that aren't perfect. And, and right. you, you can't yeah? just say, yeah, you can't just say, uh, you know, um, I always used to fight with, or I have a problem with, you know, policemen or something like that. You'll have to say what happened, why it happened, how it affects you like physically in your hands and your head, where your head goes, all that stuff you know, creates the breadcrumb for the audience. Oh, I understand that now. It's not a whitewash. It's not, I had a, I hard, had a horrible roommate who I used to throw out of the apartment. Why was she horrible? What did they wear? Yeah. What's the person's name? You know, details and specificity are really helping that sort of thing. And yeah, it can't um, just be, I had a bad roommate and this is the song I, I used to turn on to listen to when they were fighting with their boyfriend on the phone. So here's a song from Funny Girl. And it's yeah, like, that's, that, right. that had and nothing oh, to do oh, with the and, song. And for singers, stop introducing the name of the song. God, I oh mean, my if, gosh, if, you, if you didn't write it, and also it's never song, talk, song, talk, song, talk, song, talk. You can go and you don't even have to start the show out with a big song, hey, good evening, for one Zim. You don't even have to do that. I mean, I directed singers where they don't talk to the audience until two songs in, yep. you know, or they sit in the bandstand and just jam with the band when the curtain goes up, or, yeah. you know, you, you or- But you know or what, there's, there's lots, of, lots of ways to do it. And like you said, the best way to find that is to figure out who you are and, and figure out what works best for you. Not, I saw right. this on the Grammys, so I want to steal it. But. Right, and I and I say and I say, uh, or save the audience. I'll home the Grammys. I know I can't do it well. Here's all my problems of why I can't execute it well, and I'm going to do it anyway. Wish me luck. Um, yeah, so fun. You know, just be on. And I I can't tell you how many performers, comedians, singers, jugglers will they'll they'll give a line or try to be funny or some cute story. I'll be yeah. like, now is that how you normally talk to people? No, I just thought it'll be funny. Stop doing that. Stop Never do it. that again. Oh, it's so much fun. Okay, that was, I'm so glad you did that. That was a longer answer than I anticipated and it was can't perfect. Help it. Um, no, please don't. So this is the one that we, I like to end it with. Uh, what's been something you've learned and you've kind of touched on this kind of throughout the whole episode, just in the craziness of 2020 that you really want to remember to take with you. Once you don't have COVID staring you in the face, once you are on a beach that's full, once you don't have to wear a mask, what's, what's something you do want to remember about this time? It is certainly, well, I've always had a little bit of angst and I kind of had a breakthrough about that two years ago. So I think that breakthrough helped me prepare for COVID in certain ways. Uh, I, and this sounds kind of uh, hippie-ish, but I hope that, or I will strive to participate um, can, with continued kindness. Uh, generally when people are not as nice to others, it's out of their own stress and anxiety. 
Yeah. And so I've always made a, a point of being respectful to others, but internally I still feel I get, I get tight. And so to participate in a way that really brings it back to zero or back to center, like this forced everyone to do, and to participate in the next part of my life, kind of walking down the middle of the road, and whether bad things or good things happen, not have it tip me over, because I'm just going right there. That's oh, for people who can't hear me, uh, or can't see me for the podcast, I'm pointing directly down the center when I say right there. <laughs> just stay in the center and, and, um, and kind of let the balance yeah, the big picture. Look at the big picture yeah. and calm, calm down. And how am That's I today? Great. How am I doing today? Yeah, the um, looking at the big picture, but also checking in on the self care of am I working too hard right now? Am I not working hard enough right now? Do I need to take a break? But um, yeah, the big judging yourself in the macro, but paying attention to the the details. Yeah, agreed. I mean, the big picture can freak people out, so you don't. Want to yeah, that's great, man. Michael, uh, I'm going to I'm gonna let these people who have stuck around to the end, uh, I'm going to let them go. I'm going to let you go. But I just want to say thanks again for, for joining me today. Um, where can people find you? What's the best way to interact with you if they do want to hire you? By the way, uh, his, his ACM Productions, um, he talked about like Zoom and all these things. They have their own, I think it, it looked proprietary, just looking on the website, their own um, interface where you can do all those things. So if you need virtual productions of any sort, if you need a character actor, if you need a teacher, um, where can they find you, Michael? So the easiest way to, place to go for all my social media is Michael Paul Live, but my website is Michael Paul Online if you want more detailed pictures and stories and information, all that kind of stuff. Um, and on the con... I I think on the contact page or on the projects page, there's a link to ACM Pro if you productions. Um, and we don't use Zoom, we use an actual virtual broadcast system so we have control over sound and cameras and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, um, but Michael Paul Online is probably your best bet and the social media hand. Perfect. And of course, I'll link all of those in the, in the uh, show notes. Um, and yeah, reach out to Michael on Artists and Beyond if you're building your own show. What's interesting is especially the the kind of ideas in the patter. I should probably, A, talk to you about my show, but also yes, that's you should. part of the thing that I'm also uh, trying to help people with uh, with their own. So uh, go to Michael first. He's better at it. Uh, if he is too busy or too expensive, I'm the cheap and available version of, my, of that my, for your yeah, show. My, but, my yeah. uh, Artists and Beyond link is on my Instagram profile. Terrific, terrific. We'll uh, we'll link all of those things, uh, and and just go check out his YouTube page. It's it's filled with just fantastic stuff. Just, if you need a nonsense. laugh, if you need to, it it is it is, but in the best best possible way. There is literally and, no um, rhyme or reason to that page. It's the worst. It's, it's YouTube. It's the it's worst branding. Fun. Perfect, buddy. Well, thank you so much. So good to see you again. Talk nice to you to again. You. Um, and for those of you listening, remember: be bold. Reach out. Don't crawl under a fence or break any laws. But reach out to somebody figure out who you are and, and stay there and, and try to find that balance. And if you're not happy, find a, find a pivot, find a change, add something to it. Um, gosh, guys, there's, there's, there's been too much good stuff in this episode to do a good wrap up at the end. So just listen to the episode again and uh, let's try to be a little better tomorrow than we are today. Cheers.